Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Wheeler and today we're going to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. This is the Dungeon Master Roundtable number seven and, and amongst all the questions we've been answering I thought it would be good to look at passive perception but before we do that um, Mark would you like to tell everybody a bit about yourself? Yes, uh, my name is Mark and uh, with, with my friend Gonzo and Logan we are Dungeon Class YouTube channel where we uh, Talk about mostly 5e, a um, lot of different crazy ideas on how to make what we consider D&D more fun anyway. And um, so that's our channel. Josiah, would you like to tell everybody about yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad. I have a YouTube channel. You can find it if you search Dungeon Dad on YouTube, uh, primarily about D&D, D&D monsters and uh, controversial opinions about what the best player race in dnd is my name is aj pickett if you found me on youtube already uh that's because you've just aced your perception check um i've been around for a while and i've been told that i make fairly comprehensive law videos on all sorts of subjects um around the dnd sphere i also talk about other games occasionally but mostly dungeons and dragons you can also find me on other social medias Okay, so passive perception. I have to say that passive perception, when it comes to making videos on this, I made a lot of videos on this topic. People get really confused. It's a contentious topic. And it goes right back to Dungeons & Dragons 4E. I don't believe that it existed in Dungeons & Dragons 3 or 3.5. Um, and it has a couple of different reasons for being used. But I thought what would be more interesting is to sort of get an idea of whether everybody here, I mean, do you use passive perception in your Dungeons and Dragons 5e games? And sort of why or why not are you using it in your game? Because I think people have different reasons for using it, not necessarily the ones that Wizards of the Coast has stipulated as the reason to use them. What have you got, Mark? Yeah, I do use it and I like it because it can kind of don't have to have them roll for so many times like if passive perception if let's say they have a high passive perception uh i don't necessarily have to have them roll for investigation check in that room if they're really perceptive they may pick up on some of the more easy to find kind of things uh so i can shortcut the game speed things up a little bit sometimes uh, and not roll that or roll for perception um i don't have to do a lot of that i don't have to do that so for, for me it's like a shortcut so they're not rolling for everything uh, when they go on and searching a room i know sometimes the party is like i want to roll yeah i want to roll and, and i want to roll too you know like that person there saw it it was something super obvious i wanted you to find why have that we'll just speed things up a little bit things going uh i can just say oh well so and so just saw that right away here's this latch right there on the wall and and so that it just for me it's getting the story moving so they're not all just lollygagging in one room trying to search it to death. Josiah, do you use passive perception in your games and why or why not? I do, but as you said, I am one of those people who doesn't use it in the way that Wizards of the Coast <laughs> intended for it to be used. <laughs> Frequently, the way that I will use passive perception is if something is going to happen or there's something noticeable that I am going to tell the party, like, hey, you guys see this. I will usually use the passive perception score as kind of a barometer for like who sees it first, you know, like if you have someone in the party with a passive perception of 20, often in a way that you can kind of make that person's character feel like uh, I'll have a little bit of a spotlight moment is to be like, oh, you notice this and like, then also like everyone sees this, but you have like mm. a window, like basically like put to put it in game terms, like around where you notice this. So then it's can fall on that player. So instead of me describing all of it, I can tell them what they see and then they can ask me questions about it. And then they can tell the rest of the party, like they get to be the one who's kind of like, Oh guys, check this out. Like look over here. I use it that way a lot. I very infrequently use it um, for its intended purpose, which is noticing things that have a DC. And honestly, it's not even because I have such a huge hate on for passive perception, as I know some people really don't like it. I frequently just forget it exists. And that is honestly on me. And a big part of that is having played D&D for a very long time and maybe only like 10% of that time being in fifth edition. 
I just, I mean, I, I still call for reflex saves and stuff. Like, so when it comes to passive perception, I often, like, I'll have players who'll be like, oh, like if I call for a perception check and everyone rolls like crap, like, well, my passive's 18. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, you see this, <laughs> like whatever. So I, I do use it, but uh, yeah, I would say the things that I purposely use it for, not what it's intended for. And it's often on my players to remind me that it's part of the game when I forget to incorporate it into checks and stuff like that. AJ, what about yourself? Passive perception. I am the hard yes portion of the table um, of, of passive perception. I love this new mechanic. Not only that, I love it so much that I, I can see how you guys are using it wrong. And, and here's why. <laughs> <laughs> This is the part Thanks. of the video right. where we get told we're how we did it wrong. Okay. Yeah, lay, lay us out, mate. Lay us out. <laughs> yeah, I can't gatekeep you guys because you're in the hobby so so far. There's no coming back for you. It's not just passive perception. It's passive everything. Every single skill check that your character has well, trained or untrained, you've got a chance of them excelling at it. And as you sort of point out, if you take away passive perception, somebody's got a very high perce- passive perception who's kind of built their character around their, their ability to notice things. You're taking away a, a big chunk of what makes their character special. It's okay to say, Look at your, just every now and then gather up your character sheets for your players. Um, I know it's even more difficult these days because most of them have got them on their, just on their phones. Um, but you can get like, you know, copies and stuff sent over as PDFs and things. And then you just sort of print it out and you highlight, you circle things that their character is particularly good at. And as the game progresses, you keep in mind that this, this player is an expert at mosses of the Underdark and things like that. Or... They've got some sort of synergy between their skills, which may not be entirely obvious even to that player until they're, they are in an adventuring f- situation where suddenly everyone starts to turn to the character and say, what's going on? You know, what's going on? You go ahead and because you're noticing these things a lot more than we are. So they get this leadership role even temporarily because you're in their forte. And it's okay for a player character to be particularly good at a certain thing to the point where you go... It's under 20, you just get it. But what I do as a uh, a dungeon master is because the onus is on me to keep this mechanic going and I'm doing it to avoid belaboring my my players with lots of dice rolls, things that may clue them into stuff that they're not necessarily supposed to know is there. So it's a a way to sort of avoid them metagaming in the first place. Um, Is you don't just give it as roll a thing or you notice a thing because you've got the result. You turn it into a narrative back when your character was training in the wizards academy and you were you were missed with master fanion and he was describing dungeon mosses of the southeast Faerun underdark he was pointing out this particular one and you just noticed that in the track and the floor which you've just like drawn your eyes to because there's the type of moss that isn't supposed to be there how did it get there why is it in in this particular set of traps all of a sudden your character stops and everyone turns to look at what they've seen. You turn it into a narrative, or you ask for their feedback about where exactly in their training did they learn about botany or you know something like that. Now you've got an NPC that you can draw on. You've turned it into a narrative thing that, uh, that highlights their character's abilities, and you've made them feel cool. Because I've done so many videos on passive perception, I had to do a lot of research too, so I got, my, I got everything right. To defend your argument. Yeah, to defend my argument and and to sort of explain what was going on here. And I think a lot of people forget that passive perception has actually kind of really existed before 4E. Um, And we used to call it taking 10. We had a taking 20 check and we had taking 10. That was back in version 3 or 3.5. And actually, passive perception is very much like taking 10. So it's been there. And what was the criteria? There was a criteria for taking 10. And I think it's sort of only partially highlighted in passive perception for Dungeons and Dragons. And that is, you can do this if you can repeat the task and there's no like really significant consequence that's detrimental. And this is something that, you know, that that's fine. If you've got plenty of time, you're not rushed, you can make that happen. Uh, And I think that's part of the intention of passive perception. It's not just to hide the dice roll from the players so they don't know what their score is, so they don't meet a game, although uh, that's certainly part and parcel. But I think that's also the concept that, okay, 
you know, we're using this mechanic because there isn't going to be a significant outcome that you are going to find bad or good. It's just, it's just, it just happens. Mm -hmm. So, so for me, I use it to stop metagaming. Primarily that's, that's it. I don't really worry too much about the dice rolling because I've found in my games that the more dice my players roll, the happier they are, even if I find it tedious. Sometimes it's better for a dungeon master to accept tedium rather than um, annoy players. And I've had them roll dice for stupid things that I said, you don't need to roll dice for, and they still want to do it. So I, I kind of get the concept behind that. But in conjunction with that, I will often have, particularly if they say, say that, you know, tell me what they're looking for or what they're trying to do in a lot of detail, I'll use the passive perception and I'll let them do an active role. And whichever one is higher is the one I take. And I think that was the intention of the design team with regard to passive perception and all of the passive checks was to, you know, it, it does push things up. I, I totally understand what people say, yeah, DCs and pre-made adventures are too low. I agree. I change all my DCs. I make them harder because I'm doing it that way. The only thing that I find frustrating with passive perception is that although I'm trying to stop metagaming, the design team created Observant, <laughs> which is a feat which allows you a plus five to your passive perception or your passive investigation. So it's like the metagame feat. And that's, mm. that's, that's a bit of a pain. I think that's one time when you're like, oh, what are you doing, guys? Um, <laughs> but you can't, you can't ban it without upsetting too many people. So I, I, I can't ban it from my table because they just lose their nuts. Yeah. So as a result, you just run with what you've got and you change. I just change my DCs, <laughs> you know, I don't understand. I, think... I don't understand why they, they insist on having DCs that are off easy. Like 10 is easy and is medium is 15, easy. right? And, and yet mm -hmm. most med, uh, secret doors in a pre-made adventure are a 10 or a 15. Like, well, nobody makes any secret doors <laughs> really good, do they? You're going to be, everybody's going to find them. And everybody will, because that's a DC that's really easy. It, there's going to be somebody in the party that will find the secret door. So what? Well, the... you could say that the actual door is the DC 15, and the enchantment that have gone on it, so that's only a revealed. Um, it's only non-invisible when the light of last light of Durin's day shines the last moonlight on it. You know, so yeah. it's not just it's not just the DC of the door. It's it's also dwarven stone cunning and stuff like that thrown in. That but is that, true. You, you can incorporate elements of that so it's not just like, oh, there's a doorknob that no one noticed your guests all open. <laughs> I've never really thought of it that way before, but you're absolutely right. I um, I think something also that you mentioned that's really important is with stuff like the observant feat, how that's just so clearly a just a good feat. That and like lucky. Lucky is the only feat that I just blanket ban. Uh, unless someone has a very good reason for it. And I feel like that could be a whole other topic. But uh, uh, when it comes to feats like that, I, I'm always okay with players taking it because it's like, yeah, sure, you want to have a passive perception of like 25, whatever. Like, I'll just show you all the maps and you can decide which secret doors you want to know about. Seriously, though, with, with something like that, I think that it's okay for that to exist, but I do want an explanation and like a story beat from that character as to why their perception is so good, right? Like like AJ was saying, like, oh, you've trained with so-and-so and I've been trained to spot things, whatever. I, I had one character who was a brilliant PC that uh, I played with whose name was Tim, which was short for Timid, uh, who was a druid who had a passive perception of like 25. And the reason was because he was terrified of everything. He was the biggest crybaby in the world. So he was always vigilant, always watching for anything that could potentially pose a threat. So it would be hilarious in that case where he would notice a trap the party would be going through and he would like put a hand on the barbarian's shoulder and be like, oh, always look up before you go through the door kind of thing. You're like, oh yeah, I almost got shot in the face with a crossbow or whatever. So I, I think when it with stuff like that, it can be okay, but it does make it hard to balance things if... Uh, you have players just taking it because it's just a big number to add to your already big number, you know? Mm. Absolutely. Some good, um, some good uh, arguments there, some good points to, to take 
into consideration. And um, of course, <laughs> whatever you're doing at your table, you're going to do what you're going to do. So don't worry about us. Anyway, but let us know down in the comments whether you use passive perception, how you use it in your game, and why. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s.